As we focus on the theme of healthy screen habits heroes this season, I must revisit the conversation I had with Gail Dines. As the founder of Culture Reframed, Gail led the movement on building awareness of online exposure to pornography. She's made it her life's work to educate and inform parents of this ongoing public health threat. This is an encore episode from season two. As a podcaster, I've had to override the uncomfortability of listening to my own voice. That being said, I've discovered a fresh layer of hell. Listening to myself from several years ago is akin to opening my middle school diary. Welcome to the Healthy Screen Habits Podcast. I'm Hillary Wilkinson. Whether you're starting your parenting journey with a newborn or looking to connect with your teen on technology, let's learn some new healthy screen habits together. Just a note about today's episode, due to the nature of the content and discussion, we are going to recommend this be specifically for listeners over 18. Some of what gets covered is a graphic portrayal of what goes on during the filming of pornography and is not recommended for children listeners. Thank you. As the founding president and CEO of the nonprofit Culture Reframed, Dr. Gail Dines has been researching and writing about the harms of pornography for well over 30 years. Gail hit the attention of many after presenting to the American Academy of Pediatrics back in 2016 when she referred to pornography not only as a moral dilemma, but as a public health crisis. She's been called the world's leading anti-pornography scholar and activist, and I'm so honored to be welcoming to the Healthy Screen Habits podcast, Dr. Gail Dines. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. One of the things that's different about your organization is its base in research. So many times when we hear about pornography, it comes from this place of moral messaging, and your organization, Culture Reframed, is different. Is that an intentional move by you? Oh, absolutely. Because, well, first of all, I myself am a professor emerita. So, you know, I was in the academy for over 30 years. So, of course, what we say, and especially when you're dealing with a controversial topic like pornography, you need to be science based and evidence driven. Otherwise, you just get classed as some, you know, right wing moralist um, telling people what they should and shouldn't do in the bedroom. And we couldn't be further from the issue than that. Our issue is what is happening to our young people, given that they're growing up in a culture that is saturated in pornography. And we have so much empirical research now that tells us this, that really, you know, this is the position. We want to get this research out. We want to provide solutions. That's why we developed Culture Reframed, because it is really the first science-driven, evidence-based um, nonprofit to deal with pornography. Yes, and greatly needed. So uh, today's children are experiencing a very different type of sex education and upbringing than certainly you and I did. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you can kind of give sort of a historical background of how did we get here? Can you explain the present state of childhood? Yes, well, how we got here is think about, you know, generations ago where, and it used to be boys, where their first introduction was to pornography was usually their father's playboy or their brother's, you know, playboy. And what you would see would be maybe a naked woman, you know, smiling in a cornfield with no clothes on. And your access to pornography was somewhat limited. You could only steal so many copies before it became clear. And they couldn't get into porn shops. You had to show you were over 18. So what happened in 2000, when the internet became domesticated, is that the porn industry cannibalized the internet. But it has to be very clear here, it wasn't just that the porn industry cannibalized the internet, the porn industry actually helped build the internet. The R&D money to build pop-ups, pop-downs, payment systems, webmasters, that was developed by the porn industry because they understood that the more affordable, the more accessible and the more anonymous pornography is, the greater the drive is for users. So it understood its market very clearly. So pornography has been out there developing the internet 
Um, and in fact, interestingly, when you go to the biggest porn show in Las Vegas um, in January, which is run by Adult Video News, the porn show takes two floors and the largest electronics um, conference of the year takes the floor above. And you see the them going up at the same concurrently. Place. The oh. same hotel. You see them going upstairs and downstairs because it's almost meshed into one industry. So this is not an accident. OK, so we've got 2000 when that happened. And then what was astounding for those of us who study pornography was that it became hardcore instantly. All softcore porn dropped away. And the only porn really out there on the Internet was hardcore. So that was 2000. And then the big change came around 2007, the second major change, when a German businessman called Fabian Feynman started an organization called Manwin, M-A-N-W-I-N. Interesting, Manwin, women loses, you know. Sure. So, um, and what he did is he began the porn tube sites. So he developed Pornhub, X uh, videos, all of these sites that were mirrored after YouTube, where you got free uh, material and content. The so user, what did, user, oh, I was going to say the user generated content site. Well, no, not user generated. Interestingly, it was porn generated, oh. but it was free for users. Okay. Oh, Most okay. of what's on Pornhub is actually developed by the porn industry, the content. And even when they say amateur porn, Amateur porn is not porn made by amateurs. It's porn made by the porn industry to look amateur. It's a niche market of the porn industry. Oh. So the, the, most of the actual content is produced by the porn industry. But what is similar to YouTube is you can look at it all for free. Now, they do have a paywall. Um, I think it's like $16 a month. But most boys and men go to the free porn. So now let's think about this. You've got two things happening. Number one, porn has become hardcore. So when you go on Pornhub, all you see is the type of porn that two generations ago, you would have had to go into a porn shop. You would have to know somebody who would carry that level of hardcore porn. That was not on the shelves. That's now what your average eight year old boy gets to when he puts boobies or butts into, um, Google or through and now increasingly boys are getting their porn through um, Instagram and YouTube and um, also um, Snapchat. And that's no accident, by the way, because there are now porn industries or companies set up that liaises between the social media platforms of the kids and the porn industry. So this is no accident that kids are getting through Instagram and um, YouTube. So let me explain to parents what's going on, because there is a study done that found that there's this thing called a parent naivete gap, where parents do not know what porn looks like today, and they often underestimate by a factor of 10 how much porn their kids are looking at. So you have a kind of perfect storm here, which is the kids know exactly what's going on. They can get to it for free. It's hardcore, and there's no adult around them who knows what's going on. So no caretakers, parents, even when I gave that talk to the American Academy of Pediatrics, you know, it was astounding. Around 10,000 pediatricians were there and none of them, as far as I could see, had ever thought about pornography, ever. Right. And that is what I want to continue talking about after this break. Did you know that Healthy Screen Habits does workshops? For two days, we can come and guide students through an exploration of their own tech use and facilitate a research-based presentation bespoke to their own questions. 87.5% of the teens who participated in this workshop recorded a change in their tech use following participation. For more information, contact us at info at healthyscreenhabits.org. My guest today is Gail Dines, a recipient of the Myers Center Award for the Study of Human Rights in North America and author of numerous books and articles. Her latest book, Pornland, How Porn Has Hijacked Our Sexuality, has been translated into five languages. There is no one better globally to talk to than Gail Dines about this topic. And so I want to use this time to ask you, Gail, what do you wish parents understood about porn? Maybe we can even just start with what's the definition of hard 
hardcore porn when you're discussing that? Well, um, rather than definition, let's ask what hap- what's, what does the porn industry produce? That's rather than define it, let's define it by how the porn industry operates so if you so again the average age of looking at porn and some studies say 8 to 11 for a boy some we now there's a study out of the uk that says as young as seven and although i live in the us i obviously follow the research all over the world so let me tell you a boy puts boobies butts or whatever or tits into um google or gets to it through um instagram and snapchat and ends up on pornhub the most visited porn site in the world, which is up there, by the way, with Facebook and YouTube in terms of visitors. Porn site, Netflix, Amazon and Twitter combined, just so we know how large this is. So what let's think of the average boy's journey. He's put whatever into Google. Now he thinks if he's lucky, he's going to see a pair of breasts or maybe a naked woman. He is not prepared to be catapulted into a world of sexual violence and torture. And I don't use those words lightly. So let me tell you what studies have found that are the main acts that that whatever category you hit on, whether it's babysitting, stepbrother, stepmother, MILF, whatever, you will get the same um, acts. So the most common act in pornography is choking a woman with a penis, where the penis is so far down her throat, she starts to choke and can't breathe. And sometimes she vomits and they leave the vomit scene in. Strangulation, which is hands around the throat, where she is often strangled to the point, I've seen women pass out on Pornhub. So strangulation, um, that, uh, absolutely every scene ends with usually three to four men ejaculating on her face. So the average scene is a woman being orally, anally, vaginally penetrated from anything from three to five men, because the thing now they do in porn is called double vag or double anal, where there's two penises in the vagina and two in the anus. This is what the boys are seeing, where she's being spat upon, where her hair is being pulled, she's, her body is being rammed into by these men, orally, anally and vaginally. And um, they're calling it every name imaginable. And the end is that they all ejaculate all over her face, especially into her eyes. And in fact, before COVID shut down the porn industry, one of the big problems was a antibiotic resistant strain of gonorrhea of the eye was going around the porn industry for women because of so much ejaculate in the eye. This is what the average eight year old will see when he puts porn into Google. I'm not exaggerating and the, now it is because I want us to sit. I want us to take for a moment what that boy is experiencing. He's experiencing terror, fear, anxiety, self-loathing, because the older they are, the more likely they are to be masturbating to it. So they've also got the bodily arousal and fear. And it actually what you've got is a traumatic stew sitting in his body. And what we know about trauma is if you do not deal with the trauma, you keep going back to the site at which the trauma first happened. So that boy will keep going back to porn sites. So they've built in trauma as part of their business model to create porn addicts. So in our organization, we don't just look at what happens to the women and the girls in pornography and the effects of them, but also how our boys on mass are being traumatized. And then what we need to realize is after boys have watched this, they then go out and practice those on real girls and women. So um, the critical thing here to understand is that um, mainstream porn is violent, hardcore, cruel, misogynist, and it is destroying our boys as well as our girls. We cannot have another generation of boys growing up on pornography. We are beginning to see some terrible statistics. For example, it used to be that when boys of around 11 to 15 raped girls, who on average were 8 to 12, they were raping the girls because they themselves had been raped. What we're hearing now from the child protection agencies is increasingly, first of all, the age of, and I hate to use this word, rapist, is between eight to 11 and his victim is about four years old and he's not being raped himself when they do the intake interview where did you see this pornography and just recently I spoke to a um, child protection person who told me that she just had a case of a six-year-old boy and an eight-year-old boy penile raping a four-year-old girl which I didn't know was possible at six penile raping her and they were taping the rapes 
Where do they get this idea? So this this is why we call pornography a public health crisis. And everything I'm saying to you is backed up by research. Nothing I say, right, is just an um, anecdotal thing. It is research driven. So we are in such a crisis. I mean, our job is to educate parents, caregivers, all medical experts whose job is charged with taking care of children. Can you talk about the ways that you see porn becoming this a new sort of sexual script for teens? Uh, porn is the sexual script for teens. Mm. Right? Porn is now the major form of sex ed. And again, this is backed up by studies. The sexual script of pornography is that girls and women are disposable sex objects to be used and abused for men's pleasure. That is the key script of pornography. And the key script for boys is that they have no um, moral compass. They are, in fact, the image of boys and men in pornography is they are life support systems for erect penises. They are devoid of any capacity for intimacy, for connection, for empathy. And I have to say, as the mother of a son, I, on behalf of my son and all of his friends, and I'm raged that this is the image of men. This is the way they tell our boys. My son was born with every single capacity for humanity, for love, for connection. You name it, he was born with that. And if my son was born with that, then your son was. So why are we allowing the pornography industry to take away from our kids the most important capacities to be human? Because without those things, what are you? If you can't develop relationships, if you can't develop uh, a sexuality that you are the owner of, if you are being told that girls are sexually disposable and that as a boy you have no moral compass and no sense of self, what does this do to our next generation? And how dare the pornographers, how dare they hijack our kids? The most valuable resource that any culture has is the well-being of our kids. Oh, you're amazing. <laughs> I want to I want to get pom-poms and signs and you, you just you fire me up, Gail. <laughs> right. <laughs> OK. OK, so knowing that we're coming from a place of education I, and knowing these unbelievable numbers that you're giving us, average age of exposure being between eight and 11. Um, what age do you think it's appropriate to begin talking about porn with kids? I mean, we, as a, as, a, as a society, we have a hard time even bringing up birds and bees. It's just an uncomfortable talk. And now we're adding a whole other layer to it. So how, how do you go about sort of scaffolding this talk exactly that's exactly what i was going to say you scaffold it right you of course do not start talking to a four or five year old about pornography what you talk about is bodily integrity boundaries private parts um and, and especially to boys that they themselves have a form of bodily integrity and that because we set a very low bar for our boys so they need to understand that they have bodily boundaries just like girls do and then you scaffold as you go up now in terms of when you start opening the conversation the best age is around tweens which we're talking about nine to twelve and my organization culture reframed and for your listeners that's culturereframed.org we built two programs one for parents of tweens and one for parents of teens each program has 13 modules and it teaches parents and increasingly we're working with um, pediatricians and therapists and nurses how to talk to kids about porn. Um, these were built by a series of um, top draw uh, consultants, neuroscientists, pediatricians, um, adolescent health experts, sexual health experts. And then they went through another set of experts for peer review. Each program took a year and a half for us to build. And we actually offer it for free because we did not want only parents who could afford to pay for it. So this is kind of the way we do our public good is we offer these programs for free. They're being used all over the world. They're being translated into Turkish. We're talking with people to translate it into Portuguese, into Spanish, into Hebrew. Um, they were used in schools in Sweden, in Denmark, in Norway, in Iceland, in the UK. They're so robust, these, and they're also user-friendly. So you can go in for five minutes, 
five hours, five days. We have videos in there. And some of these videos you can actually watch with your kid. But we say watch them first before you decide mm-hmm. that. The other thing we've built is a social media contract where you sit down with your kid and you build a contract before they get the cell phone. And if you've already given your kid a cell phone, it doesn't matter. Go to the contract on our website and go through it. And you make your kid, well, you don't make them, you have discussions. We don't believe in sort of um, punishment-driven parenting. We believe in collaborative parenting. So we say use this, um, need this contract with your kids as a pedagogical tool. Mm-hmm. Because what you're doing is you're protecting your kid. Your kid needs to understand you're on their side. You're not here as a parent telling them what they can and can't do just because you're setting these boundaries, but you are on their side. And if you don't speak to your kids about porn, believe me, the porn industry will. And you want to get there way before the porn industry does. So that's one thing we have is our programs, again, which are free, culturereframe.org. You go in and click on our programs. And I'll have that link in our show notes as well. So people can just go on to the healthyscreenhabits.org website, go to podcasts, and then click down to find this episode, which is episode three. And we will link that in there, the culture reframe. So you have easy access to that. Um. Thank you for those resources. I think it's so important as we're building all of these healthy screen habits. I think it's a very, this is a hugely important one because the pornography industry has commanded so much of this stage. So I have one more question for you before we take our next break. And that's how do you suggest we take this conversation with teens and other porn users away from being this moral issue and address it as the public health issue? Just because I can tell you as, you know, the mom on the street type type thing, mom in the parking lot, um, you bring up the term pornography and I'm it. it it uh, you'd very definitely get a response and most people take a step back and want to view you in a different light. And do you have any tips on how to talk about it so that it addresses it just as this public health issue? Yes. Well, the way to do it is this is a multi-billion dollar industry that produces a toxic product. You would not allow your kids to be smoking (laughs) at eight years old. You would not be handing them a beer at eight years old. Why? Because we understand that kids are not ready for these things. So I would put it in the same way as the alcohol industry, the tobacco industry, other predatory industries who are out to get our kids young because we know that they develop then lifelong addictions. This is not a moral issue. It's a public health crisis because the domino effects on the boys who use this pornography, we know from studies, they have increased anxiety, depression, self-harming, Um, dropping out of academics, um, more likely to do risky sexual behavior, more likely to sexually harass and rape. And then we know from the girls who be more hypersexualized, they're more likely to be anxious, depressed, self-harm, have risky sexual behaviors too, more likely to be raped. This is why it's a public health crisis. It's not an individual. We understand, for example, that pollution is a public health crisis. Why? Because the solution is not telling a parent to help their kids stop breathing polluted air. You need a collective solution. So we come at this from a um, public health approach using a set of multidisciplinary academics, activists, um, medical experts, who pull together our programs and work with us. And that's how you do a public health approach. You break down the silos between the doctors, between the social workers, between the teachers, and you come up with a holistic plan of how to help and support your children. And in this case, ours is how to build resilience and resistance to porn culture in our children. We're going to take a little break. And when we get back, I'm going to ask Gail Dines for her healthy screen habit. Do you know what's happening during your child's online exchanges? As well-intentioned as we are, often reading every text message, post, and email is just not realistic. This is where Bark comes in to help. Founded in 2015, Bark Technologies provides a parental control app that monitors and alerts parents to online threats. Bark was created for parents by parents to offer a better, easier, and more effective way to keep children safe online. 
Spark monitors posts and messagings for things like signs of bullying and communication with dangerous strangers. Spark's algorithms analyze all activity and issue parents notifications via their chosen communication method. Gain peace of mind and get 10% off of Bark service for life by using the Healthy Screen Habits link. Go to our website at healthyscreenhabits.org, click on the Tools button in the drop-down menu, and look for products we endorse to find Bark. It will be the easiest click you make all day. Peace of mind is just a bark away. On every episode of the Healthy Screen Habit podcast, I ask each guest for a healthy screen habit of their own. This is a tip or takeaway that our listeners can put into practice in their own home. Do you have one you can share with us today? Well, I think we could do a whole show on this. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. But let me tell you what I think. And and I know this isn't easy, but I think the best healthiest screen habit is turn off the screen. And I understand, of course, that many people need it for work and that the kids need it for um, homework, absolutely. But when that's done, turn the screen off, have family life, go out into nature, become embodied, because if social media and screens do anything, they disembody us, they remove us from each other, from nature, from all the connected relationships that matter. And indeed, there's research that shows us. So as difficult as this may be, I would say the best tip I can give is make sure you have built in to the day a time when you turn off the screen completely. I love it. Maintaining that kind of sacred space, as it's called in other areas. So, Gail, if people would like to find out more about yourself or Culture Reframed, what do you think is the best place for them to look? Okay, so go on to our website, culturereframed.org. Um, and then we have lots of stuff there. And then from culturereframed.org, you can just click onto our parents program, which are again free. And um, I would also suggest that they really do save the date of October the 2nd and 3rd and come to our conference because it's directed at parents, at teachers. You know, we're expecting a whole different you know, multiple different groups coming. And um, these are going to be people in one place who are never normally in one place, the experts, the theorists, the ones who deal with children for, in multiple levels. So um, I would suggest that you come to our conference as well. So look out on the Culture Reframed website as well, because um, we will have the link on um, August the 20th to buy mm. tickets. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. And I certainly learned a lot and not all of it was pleasant, but it was all important. Well, thank you for inviting me on. It was an honor to be a guest. I really appreciate it. Thank you. For more information, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Healthy Screen Habits. Make sure to visit our website, healthyscreenhabits.org, where you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or via RSS, so you'll never miss an episode. It's free, it's fun, and you get a healthy new screen habit each week. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate you giving us a quick rating. It really does help other people find us and spread the word of healthy screen habits. Or if you'd simply like to tell a friend, we'd love that too. I so appreciate you spending your time with me this week, and I look forward to learning more healthy habits together.